All right, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, tonight, we are going to discuss uh, at least one sutra. We might discuss two. We're going to see how that goes. Uh, but tonight, we're going to talk about a little tiny sutta. Uh, it's still going to be coming from the Samyutta Nikaya, the Connected Discourses. We're over on page 655. Uh, we are still in the section that is about beginninglessness, th things that don't have a beginning. But there's really only one thing that we're talking about that doesn't have a beginning, and that's samsara, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. So the sutta that I want to read tonight, or I want to start with, is sutta number eight in the Anamagata, Anamataga Samyutta, the Connected Discourses on Beginninglessness. So actually, this particular little sutta, so this is called the Ganga Sutta, the sutra regarding the Ganges River, the Ganges. So I actually, I don't, I forget exactly when we started reading the suttas in this section, but this is the sutta that I wanted to read. Like this is the particular sutra I was interested in and talking about. But once I kind of started getting into the Anamataga Samyutta, I realized, oh, we should discuss all of these other suttas first and then get to this one. So we're going to just start by talking about this little sutra, but then I'm going to kind of explain why I wanted to focus on this one. So um, again, yeah, this is a su little sutta number eight. The River Ganges. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. Then a certain Brahman, a Brahmin, approached the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, he sat down to one side and said to him, Master Gotama, how many kalpas, how many eons, how many kalpas have elapsed and gone by? <laughs> Brahman, many kalpas have elapsed and gone by. It's not easy to count them and to say there are just so many kalpas or so many hundreds of kalpas, or so many thousands of kalpas, or so many hundreds of thousands of kalpas. But is it possible to give a simile, Master Gotama? It is possible, Brahman, the Blessed One said. Suppose, Brahman, the grains of sand between the point where the river Ganges originates and the point where it ends and enters the great ocean. It is not easy to count these and say there are so many grains of sand or so many hundreds of grains of sand or so many thousands of grains of sand or so many hundreds of thousands of grains. Brahman, the kalpas that have elapsed and gone by are even more numerous than that. It's not easy to count them and say that there are so many kalpas or so many hundreds of kalpas or so many thousands of kalpas or so many hundreds of thousands of kalpas. For what reason? Because, Brahman, this samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. For such a long time, bhikkhus, or such for such a long time, Brahman, you've experienced suffering, anguish, and disaster, and swelled the cemeteries. And then we jump back over. It is enough to be dispassionate. Is that the word? Sorry. It is enough to experience revulsion towards all samskara 
towards all volitional formations. It's enough to become dispassionate towards them. It is enough to be liberated from them. And when this was said, the Brahmin said to the Blessed One, Magnificent, Master Gotama, magnificent, Master Gotama. From today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone for refuge for life. Okay, so that's the little sutra or the little sutta. So in terms of the suttas that we've read so far from this section, this is very similar. It's the exact same idea. The Buddha is, this is exactly what we discussed last weekend, I should say. The Buddha was asked this question. How many kalpas have gone by? <laughs> and last week I defined, I, you know, I talked a lot about kalpas, which are these, you know, really long expanses of time. But when we learned about how long a kalpa is, we were already told that a kalpa, an age or an eon, is basically incalculable. It, can, it can't be measured in days, weeks, months, years, centuries, and so on. So the question, how many, how many kalpas have passed since the beginning of time? I think that's what we are to understand the question is. If you remember last week, it was a certain bhikkhu that asked the Buddha how many kalpas have passed. The Brahmin is asking, how many kalpas have passed? I take that to mean how many kalpas have, have passed since the beginning of time <laughs> in that way. So that's where if you go back two Dharma doors ago, or even last week, that's where we talked a lot about kind of ideas of time and, you know, cyclical ideas of time. I think I spoke about this uh, two weeks ago and it's, you know, yes, cyclical ideas of time don't really have a discernible beginning in that way because they just keep, it just keeps going on and on. So there's really no starting point in that way. But I mentioned that I'm not sure that we should really think about this anamataga, this beginninglessness. <clears throat> I'm not, I personally don't necessarily think that we should think of it as cyclical. <clears throat> I think my, this is the way that I understand this section. It's the way that I understand the teaching. It's a lot like... So take for, take for example, I use this example from time to time, but so I, I don't have a brother. I have a sister, but I don't have a brother. So there's, there's never been, at least, again, at least to my knowledge, but let's just say it's true that I don't have a brother. How long has it been since my brother was born? There's no discernible beginning to that. It's you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> like that that's a wrong way to ask it, right? And my point is is that my brother that doesn't exist, it, the, my brother is not trapped in cyclical time. <laughs> He's not trapped in linear time or backwards time. He's just there's just it does not compute. Any question regarding duration doesn't it doesn't add up. My understanding of what the Buddha is saying is that regarding the self, which is like my brother in terms of that it doesn't actually exist, there is no actual beginning to your suffering in samsara. <laughs> in a way, and we talked about this, I think, two weeks ago, in a way, the samsara has never even begun and it has no end in that way. So that was sort of what we've already discussed. <clears throat> if, of course, there's any questions or ideas about time and time in Buddhism, feel free to jump in. But in general, we, we've already discussed that part of it. 
Yeah, I you know we could talk about that. It's a in this case a, a Brahmin instead of one of the monks or one of the bhikkhus. I don't think there's anything particularly significant to discuss about that. So the only thing that was really kind of different here, again, besides the Brahmin and what have you, the major difference is this particular simile. Because remember, last week the Buddha gave similes as well. It was the similes of what the mustard seed <clears throat> ah, and the mountain being worn away by the silk or by the really soft cotton. So today or tonight, the Buddha, the analogy or the simile that the Buddha gives is this one about the Ganges River. <clears throat> so I assume you all know about the Ganges River. It's mentioned a lot in Buddhist texts. It's that kind of, you know, sacred major waterway, major river in India. It's kind of like that they call it the Nile, the Nile of India in that way, such an important river. So the Ganges itself gets spoken about a lot in Buddhist literature, but also just Indian literature. It's like a kind of a big part of Indian culture. I think that goes without saying, if you're familiar with it. But <laughs> this interesting idea of suppose that the grains of sand from where the Ganges River starts all the way to the Bay of Bengal, where it spits out into the ocean. <laughs> Imagine trying to count every single grain of sand in the Ganges River from beginning to end. The Buddha is saying that it's not easy to count that many grains of sand, right? So many hundreds of thousands of grains of sand, right? But this idea that the number of kalpas that have passed, it's even more numerous than that. And it's not easy to count all those kalpas, Brahman. And then this particular idea apparently was effective in kind of enlightening or kind of converting this Brahman. So he becomes a lay follower at the end. So again, the basic points, like the basic <clears throat> idea about samsara, the beginninglessness of samsara, all of that is we've discussed before. It's really just this Ganges River analogy. And it's, you know, it's what we were talking about also last week, also the week before. And it's how the Buddha uses these hyperbolic analogies to like teach as similes in that way. And what I've been trying to do with this particular, like, well, basically what I've been trying to do since we moved back to the early teachings, I've been trying to kind of read different suttas in this collection. And we're going to get into the other Nikayas, the other early teachings as well later on. I don't know when, but what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to choose suttas and choose certain texts because I want to kind of show how the Mahayana Buddhist sutras and the Mahayana Buddhist teachings, I've kind of been wanting to show how they evolve or how they seemingly evolve out of the earlier tradition. So you take this one, for example, where the Buddha mentions all of the grains of sand of the Ganges River. And this idea of the, I mean, he's saying in a way that, he, that the number of grains of sand in the Ganges River is calculable. It would be tough, but there's a way in which he's saying that there is kind of a finite amount of sand in the Ganges River, and you could count it all up. But even if you counted every single grain of sand, you still wouldn't get anywhere near the number of kulpas that have passed. All right. So I'm not tonight. I don't really want to explore this sutra exactly for the teaching of birth or beginninglessness. What I want to do now is segue over to, so I want to talk about the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra. 
You probably know it as the Diamond Sutra. By the way, if you're into the Vajra Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra, this translation by Red Pine, the great translator Red Pine, is an excellent addition. In many ways, this is all you need because it's so well footnoted, well translated, well researched. Um, don't let the size of this book fool you. The Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, is tiny. It's just 32 little chapters if you've if you've never read it. So this book is actually all commentary, footnotes, all kinds of extra information that it's really helpful. So I'm not going to get it, you know, this is not about the Diamond Sutra tonight, but I do want to focus a little bit on this. So this is from chapter 11. So the Buddha says to Subhuti in chapter 11 of this sutra, Subhuti, what do you think? If there were as many Ganges rivers as there are grains of sand in the Ganges River, would the number of grains of sand in all those Ganges rivers be great or not? And Subhuti replied, the number of grains of sand would be great indeed, world honor one, right? And then the Buddha said, well, I'll tell you, Subhuti, if a man or a woman, and in most translations, it's if a good man or a, if a virtuous man or a virtuous woman filled as many universes as there are grains of sand in all of those Ganges rivers and filled all those universes equal in number to all those grains of sand filled them all with seven tre with the seven treasures and then used all that treasure as gifts and gave it all away what do you think subuti would the merit produced by such giving be great and subuti replied it would be great indeed world honored one the amount of merit produced by all that giving would be immeasurable. It would be infinite. And the Buddha says, Subhuti, if there's a virtuous man or a virtuous woman who filled as many worlds or as many universes as all of that with the seven treasures and gave them all away, or on the other hand, if there is a noble son or a noble daughter who takes just four lines of verse from this sutra, the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, and shares and explains them with others. The amount of merit that person would get from sharing this sutra would be greater than all the merit produced from giving away all of that treasure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that's chapter 11 of the Vajra Sutra. Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra. Now, that might sound a little familiar because we're talking about grains of sand of the Ganges River, but there's a few things that I want you to notice that what happened. And by the way, just to be very kind of more explicit about this, I've already sort of mentioned this a few weeks ago or whenever it was, and it was about how basically the Buddha like the old school Buddha already spoke or taught or thought in this very hyperbolic way. And then when you move to what are called Mahayana Buddhist sutras, there's a way in which the hyperbole just gets ramped up another notch. <laughs> and for me, for somebody who kind of fell in love with that type of hyperbolic teaching, I then really appreciate Mahayana Sutras. So notice that in the Vajra Sutra, 
it's not just about, hey, Sabuti, think about all the grains of sand in the Ganges River. Is it a lot? <laughs> no, 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 no. In the Vajra Sutra, the Buddha says, hey, Sabuti, what if there was a Ganges River for every single grain of sand in the Ganges River? How much sand would all of those Ganges rivers have? Right, that's like a mind blowing amount of sand. And then the Buddha says, great. Now, for every grain of sand in all of those Ganges rivers that are equal to the number of grains of sand in a Ganges river, for every number of those sands, that's going to be not just a world, not actually just a universe, but actually a billion universes. <laughs> it's called this Tri Sahasra Maha Sahasra Lokadatu, a 3,000 great thousand world system. <laughs> it's a billion universes. And We've got a billion universes for just one grain of sand. <laughs> and then every grain of sand is now a billion universes. And the Buddha is saying, and now what if somebody took piles of gold and silver and lapis lazuli and coral and agate and red pearl <laughs> and crystal, the seven treasures, and just started stuffing universes upon universes upon universes with the seven treasures that are equal in number to the grains of sand in all these Ganges rivers, and then just started giving it all away. <laughs> what do you think, Sabuti? Would that person get a lot of merit from doing all of that giving? <laughs> So at that point, if you've been following along between the grains of sand equaling Ganges rivers, and now the, those grains of sand equal universes, and we're, if you've been following along, it's like, wow. That... So what do you think, Subuti? <laughs> what about somebody that just took four lines of wisdom and shared them with somebody else? Well, somebody sharing the wisdom of this sutra would get way more merit than giving away all of those treasures. So it's a long hyperbolic way of making a point, if you know what I mean. <laughs> now, the point, by the way, oh, I didn't even give you the, the funny part. And oh, and I re actually really wanted to share this with you. So if you read the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra and you're in, in like you're really into this, like the way that the Buddha is kind of funny and hyperbolic, <laughs> well, then if you're into that, you can read the Vajra Sutra and notice that, so I just read to you from chapter 11. Chapter 11 is where the Buddha says, if there was a Ganges river for every grain of sand in the Ganges river. If you go back, though, a few chapters to chapter eight, what the Buddha says is, hey, Subhuti, what do you think? If someone filled a tri sahasra maha sahasra lokadatu, so one of those great 3,000 world systems, which is, I was said is a billion worlds, in chapter eight, the Buddha says, hey, Subhuti, what do you think? If somebody filled a 3,000 great thousand world system with the seven treasures and gave them all away, would that person get a lot of merit? <laughs> and Subhuti says, wow, yeah, that would, that would be a lot of merit. <laughs> and the Buddha says, well, if somebody just gives somebody <laughs> four lines of, of this sutra, it'll be more merit than that. So in chapter eight, it's already kind of crazy to be filling 
worlds it would be crazy to fill a world <laughs> with, with seven treasures so to fill just all of these worlds with the seven treasures it's already hyperbolic it's already wild then you go to chapter 11 where the buddha's like all right now what if there was a tri sahasra mahasrasa lokadatu for every grain of sand in Ganges rivers equal to the number of grains of sand in the Ganges river. And by the way, the Vajra Sutra, it just keeps going like that, where the Buddha keeps making the analogy bigger and bigger and bigger. And so if you read the Vajra Sutra that way, it's kind of funny where the Buddha just kind of keeps upping the analogy. So I wanted to share that with you, but I also don't want to leave you without any like uh, wisdom in a sense. Like, well, but what's the point of all of this? It's like, it's, it's cool and it's cute to speak so hyperbolically, but so in this instance, meaning in the, in the Vajra Sutra instance, the Vajra Sutra, you, so actually let me back up a couple of steps. I kind of dove a little quickly into the Vajra Sutra that way because I, I kind of always presume everybody already knows what the Vajra Sutra is all about. But if you don't, the Vajra Sutra, again, usually called the Diamond Sutra, it's a really interesting sutra because it is so close to being the kind of sutra that you would find in the old collections. It's very close. There's only a few major things about it that make it what we would call a Mahayana Sutra. And so the, the whole sutra is really simple. It's really just a dialogue between the Buddha and a monk, Subhuti. And Subhuti basically asks the, the Buddha, What's up with the bodhisattva path? Like, what's up with being a bodhisattva? And then the Buddha's basically like, oh, you want to know about the bodhisattva path? Well, let me tell you. And proceeds to give 32 chapters or 30, 30 more chapters of teachings that are about the Mahayana. <clears throat> now, excuse me. If, you know, it depends upon where you fall on this debate. If you're like a really kind of hardcore Theravada Buddhist that only reads the uh, Nikayas, that only reads the Pali Canon, for somebody that adheres to the Pali Canon, this is not the actual teachings of the Buddha. The Vajra Sutra is this made, it's like made up. It, it's from hundreds of hundreds, if not many hundreds of years after the Buddha. Uh, the teachings are totally different. It's just that's the attitude of somebody who adheres to the Pali Canon. For somebody who is in the Mahayana tradition on the Bodhisattva path, these were just the first things that the Buddha taught. And then the Buddha went on to teach more advanced teachings. And if you read a sutra like this, again, it's really hard to make a distinction between the type of Buddhism and knowledge that's presented in here and the type of Buddhism in here. But this sutra is definitely in dialogue with the Pali Canon. And what I mean by that is, is that this sutra, the Vajra Sutra and beyond Mahayana Sutras, they're fully aware of the Pali Canon. They're fully aware of what are called the Hinayana teachings. And so what the standard interpretation of chapter 11 and, and chapter 8 and those other hyperbolic chapters that I didn't read that are later on in the sutra, the main point that is trying to be made with that is that in the Mahayana 
thinking, they begin to, they don't make a distinction, but they start to talk about the difference between, uh, there's a term, they have technical terms for these things, but what it is, is you could think of it as, um, I don't even like all these words. These words are terrible, but they talk about the giving, ultimately the giving of stuff versus the giving of the Dharma. And what the analogies that I just read the from chapter eight and chapter 11, they're talking about how the giving of wisdom far outweighs the giving of any material object. It's ultimately what the seven treasures represent. By the way, in case you don't know, but you've heard about these seven treasures, the, the these famous seven treasures that the Buddhists are always talking about. I listed them a moment ago. They are normally given as like gold, silver, lapis lazuli, coral, agate, red pearl, and crystal. That's the list that I sort of know. But you should also know that there are seven, they're called the seven treasures, but they're called like the seven treasures of a country. And it's about the king, the ministers, the army, you know, it's this kind of idea of running a state and you need to have all of these components to running a state. And so there are some interpretations that the seven treasures are about maintaining control of state power. And another interpretation is that, that it's about wealth and jewels and things like that. Either way, the sutra is saying that you could fill a universe <laughs> with kings and armies and ministers and assistants and aides and all of that. Or you could fill a universe with gold and silver and money and billions and billions of dollars. And you could give billions of dollars away. <laughs> and it wouldn't be anything compared to giving just four lines of wisdom from a sutra like this. So the idea is, is that in the early Buddhist tradition, what, again, what would be called the Hinayana, there was a lot of emphasis put on accumulating merit, accumulating punya. And you could get a lot of punya by giving, by being generous, you know, giving money, giving stuff, all of that. And so in early Buddhism, you were basically trying to accumulate merit. Merit could be used for all kinds of things. Merit could be used to get a better rebirth. Merit could be used to basically, you could kind of transmute merit into enlightenment, sort of, in the early Buddhist tradition. And so early Buddhists and a lot of Buddhists in the modern world, by the way, I don't want to make it sound, I definitely don't want to make it sound like this died out. This is very much alive and well, but what it is, is it is the accumulation of merit. But like, like um, what I mean is it's, there is a strong tradition of people doing generous things in order to get the merit. <laughs> in other words, it's kind of like, I don't really want to give this to you, but I'm going to give this to you because I'm going to get some merit in return. And basically what seems to have happened is that there was a branch of Buddhism that would become the Mahayana that were like, you know what? That seems like another form of clinging and attachment and ownership. <laughs> like clinging to punya, clinging to merit. So the Mahayana begins to take a whole other approach to the accumulation of merit in that way. 
And ultimately, and we, we're not going to get into this tonight, but ultimately, what makes the Mahayana tradition very distinct from the early Buddhist tradition is that they incorporate what is known as the transference of merit. And what that I, it, it's a very Mahayana thing. And what it is, is it's in the early Buddhist tradition, again, people were sort of like hoarding merit and it became just another attachment. Some Buddhists recognize that. And seemingly began this process of, yeah, do good things. Yes, accumulate merit. Yes. But then once you've accumulated all that merit, transfer it away and transfer it to the benefit of all beings. And then you'll, you're, you'll be done with it. Like you won't cling it. You'll give that away in that sense. So that's kind of a different attitude towards punya or merit. And that different attitude towards merit is what is being expressed in chapter eight, chapter 11, and chapters beyond that. It's basically talking about the, well, I don't want to go too deep because I do want to say a lot more about this, but there's two ideas, two ideas that you could think about. In English, we have a, an expression, and that expression, it goes something along the lines of, if you give somebody a fish, they can eat for a day. If you teach somebody to fish, they could eat for the rest of their life. The idea here is, is that if I gave you money or a physical object in that way, that may be good and nice and beneficial and helpful to a certain degree. But the idea here is, and I'm going to, I'm going to just break this down super simply. But if we really understand the Dharma, like we really understand the teachings, and in particular, if we really understand the teaching of no self, the value of this incredible teaching that we've been talking about now for weeks and weeks and months and months, but that incredible teaching about no self, that if you understood that, you wouldn't have any craving for anything. And what that means is you wouldn't need anything from me. If I were to give you some money or to give you a physical object that might help you out in the short term, but then you'd probably just be coming back to me for more money or more stuff in that sense. But if I taught or gave you the teaching of no self and you really understood that the value of that is immeasurable it is in the, this is what the vajra sutra talks about it talks about how the merit of sharing these teachings it's in, you can't measure it it is kind of anamataga in that sense of like not beginningless but it is inconceivable and what I want us to think about is how conceivable the merit is when I give somebody some money. And I'm not saying it's bad to give people money and help people. I'm not saying that. And it's not what the sutra is saying. What it is saying, though, is, is that if you really took the time to help somebody in that kind of, quote, call it a spiritual way, that that would it would be far better in that way. So that's sort of what the basic underlying kind of teaching in that is that idea. But ultimately kind of what I would wanted to accomplish here tonight with this kind of Dharma talk, I wanted to kind of point at how, uh, I wanted to point at how the, the Ganges river counting the grains of sand in the Ganges river I wanted to show you how that simile in the 
in the old suttas, in the Anamataga Samyutta section, I wanted to show you how that simile of the grains of sand is working to convey a teaching that, and remember, you need, you're going to have to go back now weeks and weeks, but all of this stuff about samsara not having a beginning, it's all coming from all of the stuff we talked about, about the aggregates and the idea of a self versus the aggregates and the clinging to the aggregates. So my point is, is that the use of the grains of sand to speak about something that is anamataga, that's beginningless, or call it immeasurable, or call it inconceivable. Notice that in the Mahayana, in a sutra like the Va in the Vajra Sutra, notice that the use of the Ganges River and counting the grains of sand in the Ganges River is still being used to talk about a, a certain type of inconceivability, the inconceivable merit that it, and if you don't like this word merit, I, I, I encourage you, actually, I should have said this before we had all this talk about merit. If you're not into this idea of merit, like that, that word, or even that idea, like doesn't resonate with you that you don't be either believe it or don't even know what they're talking about. A really helpful substitution is you can use, you could use the term or you could use the, the translation of advantage. And what I mean by that is if, if, if I was if I if I was the type of person to get up every morning and go swim five miles or whatever, it would be legitimate to ask, what's the advantage of that? Like, what are you getting out of that? And the idea is, is that if you think there's an advantage to doing that, you could think of that as merit, as punya in that sense, that there's a um, something to be gained there, an advantage. And of course, we could think in terms of the advantage of something in that sense. And so now let's think about not the amount of merit gained. Now let's think about it as, hey, subuti. which is more advantageous, right? Which is has more um, advantage? Giving somebody a chunk of gold or silver or teaching them Dharma, which is more advantageous? And the idea is that the, the teaching that's being espoused in the sutra is the idea is that teaching the Dharma is far more advantageous there's much more adva advantages to that than just giving material objects. But what I really want to emphasize, though, is what the Buddha is saying, though. He's not saying that if I give you gold and silver and lapis lazuli, or I give you four lines of verse from a sutra, the Buddha is not saying that the advantages or the merit of giving the wisdom, he's not saying that it's more exactly. He's saying that there, it's like incomparable. And that's a different emphasis. And it goes back to the example I gave, um, however long ago, about my brother that doesn't exist. And then asking the question about like how long he's been around or whatever. And it's like, well, you can't ask that question about that. It's a kind of apples and oranges type of a thing. Well, the, the analogy in the Vajra Sutra is the same idea that the, the amount of advantage or merit to giving four lines of verse or giving wisdom, it's incomparable. It's at a whole other level. And why that is, 
that's what we want to explore kind of for the rest of tonight is we want to be asking that question, but why is that so much more in that way? <clears throat> and it's like the sutra about the Ganges River in that way, in terms of the Buddha's trying to emphasize the beginninglessness of samsara, the beginninglessness of these kalpas. And so putting it in, again, in what we've been calling this hyperbolic way. So, all right, I'm going to pause there because I just have, we've gone like three sutras and all kinds of stuff. So questions, comments, answers, ideas. Any? Yeah, Maria. Um, okay, so it seems like there's, well, there's a lot of things going on here, but um, so, um, it seems like there's a, a contrast between, um, that Hinayana's, um, point of view of sort of getting, um, liberation for oneself versus the Mahayana, uh, point of view of getting liberation for all beings everywhere. Um, and that seems to be at play here. Um, and then um, <clears throat> that seems to also be connected to this idea of getting merit for, for oneself to try to get, you know, a more fortunate rebirth for oneself um, or you know, liberation for oneself um, versus, uh, you know, trying to, um, you know, increase virtue or merit or whatever for the sake of all beings and then dedicating it um, in that way. Um, and um, um, oh, oh. Um, I thought it was, um, I'm just curious, was there maybe an element of trying to sort of keep it wholesome in terms of the sort of human tendency to try to, you know, buy our way, mm -hmm. you know, like in the Catholic church, people tried to buy their way into heaven by making big donations to the church itself. Um, so I imagine there was, there were probably, you know, kings or people that thought oh um you know show me how to the fast track to enlightenment and i'll give you this you know monetary donation or whatever anyways some some ideas there. Mm -hmm. uh great ideas maria and indeed there do appear to have been a lot of social issues um regarding things that you were saying in terms of sort of Basically, just to put it simply, people trying to buy their way to nirvana, so to speak, and that type of punya exchange, like the punya market in that sense in the early tradition, does seem to be, like I was saying, seems to become problematic. And so the a lot of the Mahayana stuff is responding to that, like I was saying. In fact, the Mahayana like I, I was also saying, is responding to a lot of the problems that seem to have developed in the so-called Hinayana. The main one that I point out a lot is that for, for a tradition that espouses such equanimity and equality and, is, and kind of really, you know, disparages characteristics the early Buddhist tradition still does that weird thing that elevates men over women, which is so weird and discriminatory and not equanimous and not equal. And that is something that is, I feel like, not corrected. I wish it were corrected, but is an issue that the Mahayana addresses and recognizes that the Hinayana has a problem with that. They've got a punya problem. They have a, apparently... They had a, the early Hinayana, according to the Mahayana, had a kind of um, machismo uh, austerity problem. Like 
people trying to like, oh, you you went you went three days meditating straight. I went four days meditating straight. Oh, well, I did five days. And like, so the, kind of this competitive spirit in terms of whether it was exhibiting spiritual superpowers or samadhi states. So all of that competitiveness or unequality are things that you find in the Mahayana tradition and the Mahayana sutras being worked out and being spoken about. So um, by the way, Maria, you did mention the classic kind of um, Hinayana Mahayana division, which is the Hinayana, it's enlightenment for myself and the Mahayana, it's enlightenment for all sentient beings. I want to talk about that. So we're going to talk about that idea of the Mahayana liberation of all sentient beings. So we're going to do a second sutra tonight. So I'm still in the same section, but I'm going to jump over to sutta number 10. We're skipping little sutra number nine. Little sutra number nine is the, the Danda Sutta, the stick. And it's just another one about the innumerable number of kalpas in which you've been roaming around samsara. So, but number 10, page 656, and I didn't, uh, uh, Dean, I didn't send a link for this one. So apologies for that. I wasn't sure if I was going to get there tonight. So this sutta is called person. But I want to explain that word. So in the Pali language, this word is a pugala. In Sanskrit, it's called a pudgala with a D, pudgala. Same word, same idea. So a pudgala or a pugala. And that word, it means like a person or personhood or personality even. And I, I've spoken about the Pudgala in Dharmador's past, but I'll mention it again really quickly. So there, there is this term, and we're going to hear it used by the Buddha, a person. And that idea of a Pudgala in certain branches of early Buddhism certain branches of the Hinayana, certain branches of the early Buddhist tradition, they heard the Buddha talking about this Pudgala or Pugala. And then they took that as an idea, meaning like a, a doctrine, a teaching of the Buddha, which is that there is this personality or per personhood. And what that is, is and this is in these certain branches of early Buddhism. Er, certain branches of early Buddhism recognized they were good Buddhists so that they did understand the aggregation of the five skandhas. So they did understand that this is a, a ever-changing, ever-evolving configuration of form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. And what that means is, is that at any given moment, there is this set, set of skandhas. And in the next moment, it's a different set of skandhas. Things have changed. The state of consciousness is different. What is being perceived is different. What is being sensed is different. So in Buddhism, as we've been talking about for weeks and weeks and weeks now, there is this sort of ever-evolving, ever-changing set of skandhas, but certain branches of early Buddhism started talking about what they would term a continuity of consciousness, it's a term that is, uh, the uh, Sanskrit would be a chitta sentana. It's called the mind stream. If you look up mind stream, 
That is the chitta sentana. And that idea that, oh yeah, yeah, it's a different consciousness and a different perception and a different, all of, it's all different each moment, but there's a continuity to it all. And that continuity accounted for personality. And what that is, is, is that you may have seen this in your own life, but it's where a, a baby or a child, as they grow up, yeah, they're, it's a different body year, you know, moment after moment. And it's a different kind of person in a way, but there's a certain personality that is kind of present in all the versions. And there's a certain branch of early Buddhists that identified that continuity of consciousness as a pudgala, as like personhood. And what that was is it was a really clever way of some early Buddhists. It was a clever way of accounting for the experience of a self, both a self-reflexive experience of a self, which is, you know, the idea that you have about yourself, the idea I have about myself. So the pudgala was the personality and it was about other people viewing me and then them, you know, thinking I have that, there's something michael -y about this. So it was a very clever way of some early Buddhists to account for the self without claiming a eternal, permanent self. So that means I, they weren't breaking this sort of doctrinal rule against the two extremes of eternalism or, or nihilism. So it was very clever, and there's a lot of books or a few books that have been written about this group of Buddhists, but here's the thing. So let's read about the Pudgala and how it was spoken about by the Buddha. So this is the Hinayana, old school Pali idea of the Pudgala. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling on Rajagaha, on Vulture's Peak, there the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied. And the Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, this samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. One person, a pudgala, roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving, would leave behind a stack of bones, a heap of bones, a pile of bones, as large as this Mount Vepula. If there were someone to collect them, and what is collected would not perish, you got to see the footnote if you have the wisdom edition. That's a tricky one. And why, Bhikkhus? Because, Bhikkhus, this samsara is without a discoverable beginning. And then that's our refrain that we have seen in every one of these sutras. And it's about how a first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on in samsara. It's enough to be turn away from those samskaric conditions or conditionings, it's enough to be liberated from them. This is what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the fortunate one, the teacher, further said this. The heap of bones a pudgala leaves behind with the passing of a single kalpa would form a heap as high as a mountain. So said the great sage, this is declared to be as massive as the, as the tall Vipula mountain standing north of Vulture's Peak in the Magadan mountain range. But 
When one sees with correct wisdom the truths of the noble ones, suffering, its origin, the overcoming of suffering, and the noble eightfold path that leads to suffering's appeasement, then that person, having wandered on for seven more times at most, makes an end of suffering by destroying all the fetters. So, once again, we're kind of dealing with this analogy of the lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes that have passed in Nirvana, or sorry, in Samsara. And this pile of bones that would be left behind by a Pudgala, in that sense, by a person, now, in reading that sutra, it would definitely sound like the Buddha is not talking about a continuity of consciousness, <laughs> this chitta santana idea, because the whole point is, is that the continuity of consciousness idea is not the body. <laughs> it is this kind of meta, or it is understood as this kind of meta aspect of consciousness, which is the self or a provisional self. So the Buddha definitely seems to be using Pudgala in a different way here than, than it came to be used. He seems to be just referring it to anybody, a body, any body in that sense. So the difference is we want to look at that last verse, but when one sees with correct wisdom, the noble truths. So the Aryas, the noble ones, right? The truths of the noble ones, the noble truths. And those are the four noble truths. The noble truth of suffering, where it comes from, how to overcome it, and the path that leads to its overcoming. So one who with correct wisdom sees the four noble truths, that person, and then this idea of that person having wandered on, we need to remember that samsara, the actual word samsara, it means to like roam around, to wander, right? So it doesn't, it's not actually talking about cyclical birth and rebirth exactly. It's a term that means to wander around. So when the Buddha says that that person who with correct wisdom sees the Four Noble Truths, well, then that person, samsara's on, is the idea. They samsara on, they wander on for seven more times at most. And then they make an end of suffering and cut off the fetters. So what that is referring to is and if you didn't know this there is a, a teaching in the buddhist in the early buddhist tradition there is a teaching that is known as the four fruits the four fruits are these four stages of spiritual development in early buddhism they are called the stage of the stream enterer right the shroto apana the stage of the anagamen or sorry, the chakra dagamin, the once returner, the anagamin, the non-returner, and then the arahat, the worthy one, an enlightened one. So those are the four stages of development in early Buddhism. And what, um, I didn't know this for a long time, in the early Buddhist tradition, if you were a stream enterer, you only had seven more rebirths maximum. <laughs> maximum. It might be six, it might be five, might be four, but definitely no more than seven more rebirths if you're a stream enterer. Again, if you make it to the second level, the chakra dagaman, you've only got one more rebirth. If you make it to the level of an anagaman, you will die in this world 
and then kind of take on a limbo state of rebirth in a meditative heavenly realm where you can finish out your practice. Or it might be that you finish the whole practice here in this life and you become an arahat and an arahat isn't coming back anymore at all. So that's the progress of this. And so this is an illusion when it says that somebody who with correct wisdom, who sees the Four Noble Truths, they will wander on in samsara for no more than seven times. And that is the kind of standard early definition of a Shrota Opana. It's someone who has seen correctly the wisdom of the Four Noble Truths. If you see it and you get it, that's called a stream enterer. And again, you've only got seven more rebirths. <clears throat> Any questions about that before I move to this next idea? So here's what happens though. And it's why I kind of was hoping to wrap all of these ideas up tonight in one uh, kind of one night. So going back to the Diamond Sutra, going back to the Vajra Sutra. So the Vajra Sutra is a very interesting sutra because the Buddha, and actually I'm going to, I'm not going to dig through there to find it. I have a different version up on my computer here. Just going to read from this. So Here's the basic idea of the Vajra Sutra. If you've never read it or you haven't read it for a while, this is the, like, the key idea to this sutra. The Buddha tells Subhuti, well, it's like this, Subhuti. And by the way, I'm reading from chapter three. He says, of all the kinds of beings in the world, whether they're born out of an egg, out of a womb, out of water, or just out of nowhere. <laughs> he says, of all kinds of sentient beings, whether they're born from an egg, a womb, moisture, or just metamorphosis, whether they have form or they are formless, whether they have perception or they don't have perception, or they might be a meditator in the state of neither perception nor non-perception. This is the Buddha talking. It's difficult to quote this because it's the, the Buddha's talking and he's saying, of all those beings, if I caused them all to enter nirvana and liberated them, and I did that, liberating immeasurable, incalculable, illimitable numbers of sentient beings. In reality, not a single sentient being attains liberation. And why, Sabuti? If bodhisattvas think in terms of a self, a pudgala, an individual, a sattva, a sentient being, or jiva, a life form. If a bodhisattva thinks in terms of self-individuality, sentient being, or life form, they're not a bodhisattva. So this is going back really quickly to when Maria had mentioned that in the Mahayana path, there's this idea of liberating all sentient beings. And there is this idea of liberating all sentient beings. But what's interesting about the Vajra Sutra in particular is that the wisdom that is being conveyed in this is that at the end of the day, no sentient being ever gets liberated. And it took me personally a very long time to understand the Vajra Sutra. I understood early Buddhism, like the basic Dharma stuff. That was like in graduate school. But the this Mahayana stuff, oh, 
it took so long for me to understand like what was being said. And then when, once I kind of understood it, it was so simple. It was so like, huh. Of course, what the Buddha is talking about is, is that the wisdom, the teaching is that there's no self. <laughs> to understand that is to be liberated. But there's no sentient being. That's what I just said. There's no sentient beings. There's no such thing as a self. <laughs> to understand that is liberation. Notice how no sentient being is ever liberated in all of this. There is just the realization that there is no self in that way. By the way, this is exactly what the Buddha is talking about when he says, and why is all of that, Subhuti? Because bodhisattvas don't think in terms of an Atman, a self, a Pudgala, a personality, a Sattva, a sentient being, or even the idea of a jiva, a life form, in that way. Now, it's way too late in the evening, and it's a very deep teaching to go through no self, no pudgala, no personality, no sattva, no sentient being, and no life, no life form. That's tricky. But what I want you to kind of know, or, you know, kind of what I would like to share with you is that the Vajra Sutra that is, is constantly making, oh, by the way, the idea that there, or the teaching of no self, individuality, sentience, or life, this is a refrain. This runs through the Vajra Sutra. It is, the, it is constantly being repeated that this is the teaching of this sutra, that there's no self, individuality, sentience, or life. And tonight, I wanted to focus on, or one thing I wanted to focus on, is the Vajra Sutra is actually responding to those early Buddhist traditions that started talking about there being a Pudgala. So this is clarifying it. The Buddha is saying, no, everybody, <laughs> there's no Atman, there's no Pudgala, there's no Sattva, and there's no Jiva. There's none of that. And then, if you really want to get into this, the key, one of the key chapters for really understanding the Vajra Sutra is chapter 9. And it's the chapter where the Buddha actually talks about the stream enterer, the once returner, the non-returner, and the arahat. Now, I was doing something tricky, or I was trying to do something tricky, which is a little mo a moment ago, when I was telling you that a, a stream enterer only has seven more rebirths, and then the chakra document only has one more rebirth, you should have been out there saying, wait, what? <laughs> what has seven more rebirths? What has only one more rebirth? What is not coming back again? If you were thinking that, then you were on board with Subhuti. You were on board with the Vajra Sutra because chapter nine reads something like this. Subhuti, what do you think about this? Is a stream enterer able to have this thought? I'm a stream enterer or not. And Subhuti says, no world honored one. And why? Stream enterers are named for entering the stream. But in reality, there's nowhere to enter. Not entering sounds, sights, smells, flavors, tactile sensations, or thoughts. Not entering the, those sensations, that's a stream enterer, Subhuti says. And then the Buddha says, all right, Subhuti, what do you think? Is a once returner 
able to have this thought? I'm a once returner or not? And Subhuti replies, no way, world honored one. Why? Because once returners are named for returning only once again. Yet in reality, there is no returning once again. Understanding that is called being a once returner. And then they go for the anagaman, the non-returner. Hey, Subuti, what do you think? Can a non-returner have this thought? I'm a non-returner or not. And Subhuti replies saying, no way, world honored one. And why? Because non-returners are named for not returning. Yet in reality, there is no not returning. <laughs> to understand that is called not returning. And then finally, Subhuti, what do you think? Is an arahat able to have this thought? I have obtained the state of an arahat or not. And then ultimately, the, the Subhuti says no. And why? Because ultimately, there isn't anything that is an arahat. That's why they can't have that thought in that way. So chapter nine is this beautiful, in my opinion, this beautiful reworking of this kind of classic Buddhist uh, system of these four stages, but it's a reworking of that within the philosophical framework of Mahayana Buddhism. Because I want you to notice that it's not that there isn't a stream enterer, once returner, non returner, or arhat. It's just what that is has been sort of redefined within a more um, well, in a way that's more in accord with Mahayana teachings in that way. So, any questions about that? Vajra Sutra questions, any questions? Yeah, Maria. So I just have a comment about one um, aspect of this that's sort of conversely mind-blowing so if you start if you you know when i think about um sort of this unfathomable amounts of time at the grains of sand and the ganges and the ganges inside the grains of sand and all of that and then you know that's supposed to sort of represent this beginningless samsara and then to sort of conversely be mind blown by the idea of bringing that to a halt or coming to the last few of those um some you know um the idea of like you know this unfathomable amount coming down to seven or a few or one or none um it's it's another moment for me um, to sort of have arrived here in this such hmm. moment to be experiencing all of this and hearing it. And um, so taking that in. Nice. So uh, a lot of Maria's reaction there is sort of why I wanted to get into this section, the Anamataga Samyutta section of this to kind of point at how this type of, um, you know, you could call it mind blowing, mind bending, you know, whatever, you know, choose your adjective. But I did want to point out that this type of hyperbolic mind kind of bending way of talking is not exclusively a Mahayana thing. It's very much a part of Buddhism since day one in that way. <clears throat> And I think uh, just to, to say one thing uh, based on what Maria commented on, I think, so actually, I mean, this is a big idea, so we'll save a lot of this for next week. 
a lot of this, especially the, the specific language around like immeasurable and incalculable. It's about sort of like really understanding or thinking about calculable. And what I mean by that is, is that even if we're upwards of, I don't know, a billion or a trillion or a quadrillion or a quintillion or a sextillion or a septillion or an octillion or a nonillion, there's a way in which, yeah, you know, we could keep counting and keep coming up with names and words and all of that. But there's a way in which all of that, it's very like logical and rational, actually. And my point is, is it's very, um, what I want to get at is that even though we are, you know, even the idea of a nonillion, a nonillion, you know, a, a number that is so big, but it's still just kind of a bunch of ones. <laughs> it's very actually narrow. It's a very narrow way of thinking, even though it sounds so big. The idea of like incalculable, inconceivable for me all of that is pushing at the edges of reason in that way. And kind of like, it's basically for me, it's saying what we're talking about, like the Dharma that we're talking about is not in any way calculable, measurable and all that, because, you know, your, your taxes are calculable. If you know what I mean, mundane worldly things are measurable space is immeasurable space is this utterly beyond kind of an idea and that's why the buddha is sort of always pointing at space and and like you know again objects are conceivable calculable measurable quantifiable space immeasurable unquantifiable, completely beyond actually. Nirvana, wisdom, enlightenment, prajna, all of these ideas, they're over there. Meaning in the immeasurable, in the incalculable realm. And what that is, it's for me is you will, you will never ever get at that stuff. The wisdom, the enlightenment, the prajna, You'll never get at that stuff with the mind that thinks calculably. If you get out your calculator, you will never kind of find the way to nirvana. If you know what I'm saying, because it's just an utterly different road. That's, that is the terrestrial mundane road of calculations. And to try to get to nirvana or even think about nirvana using that mind, you'll never get there, Subhuti. You need this sort of more expansive mind, which is why the Buddha is always trying to blow Subhuti's mind in the Vajra Sutra, because Subhuti actually is very rational. It's part of Subhuti's charm. He's very logical. And he's always trying to understand what the Buddha is saying in a very logical, rational way. And that's where the Buddha's like, no, 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 no. We got, we got to think about this a little differently. So for every grain of sand in the Ganges River, that's a Ganges River. And, and by the way, that's why, or one of the reasons why the Diamond Sutra or the Vajra Sutra becomes such a part of the Zen tradition, because the Zen Buddhist tradition is so interested in not being logical. And understands that logic is, again, for paying your taxes and stuff. It's it's not for understanding the Dharma in that way. So, All right. And on that note, on the illogical, I'm going to pause there. Unless there's any last comments or questions or ideas. Cool. Thank you all again for coming, for being here. Always appreciate seeing you all. 
Um, so I think tonight this might be our last night on the Anamataga Samyutta. Uh, so stay tuned for next week when we're probably going to move. I think we're going to stay in the Samyutta Nikaya, but we're just going to move to a different section because there's just so many good sutras in here. And if we move to a different uh, a different source or a different a set of texts, I don't know when we'd ever return to this. So let's keep going with this. And that'll be uh, next Sunday. So I hope to see you then. Thank you.